Hello, hello, beautiful women. Um, okay, so <laughs> I have really not been looking forward to this because last night I did a really lovely live um, and I think only two people were on and my phone died the second I was done with it and I didn't get a chance to, to save it or post it. So this is take two. I wanted to introduce myself a little bit more, put my face out there, which I don't really like doing a lot of the time. I've had a rough couple years when it comes to my own confidence and things I've dealt with in my own life, um, with divorce, with some dental things I've been dealing with, and my own shadow work process that has been coming up in terms of the way I relate to myself and other people has taken me into my own little hermit mode a little bit. So I know that I need to show up if I want to really build this space like I want to. And that's what the point of this live is. This video is to talk about why and where I came up with Wildly Awakened Motherhood. Um, so you may have noticed if you've been following me for a little while that I kind of added another Instagram account. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to have a separation between this community space, which is open for women, for support, for um, informational purposes. I have the Facebook women's group as well that I try to get people to kind of go to from here where we do more events in that space. And I wanted to keep my birth related work, my specific birth work and embodiment practices that I'm going to be building in that business in that page. So they're connected, but they're a little bit different in their focus. So I did want to create a separation a little bit of a separation between the two just because of that. This is going to be more a community-based space where we do kind of events and circles and stuff. And the other one is more about my business work around the embodiment practices and my birth work as a birth keeper. So that's that. And I'm doing more videos in that embodied birth work space as well that I won't have on this page more of my embodiment practices in terms of singing and movement and yin yoga, all of that stuff. So if you're interested in that and learning more about my embodiment practices and birth work, the movement medicine, go check out Embodied Birth Work. Um, and I'm a birth keeper and you can find me over there as well. But this um, came to me a long time ago and it took a while for it to kind of come for me to actually do it. <clears throat> so when I became a new mom, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even really know if I wanted to be a mom. I was just beginning to dip my toe into like the holistic wellness space. I was a personal trainer at the time and I had just gotten my yoga certification, a really basic one just to be able to teach at that fitness center. So I hadn't really gone down the rabbit hole of the yogic philosophy and where that journey will later take me yet. So I was still kind of in the beginning process. I was fairly aware of nutrition and just how to take care of your body. At least I thought I did. So my birth, my first birth was not a particularly good one. It's kind of that typical story we find around with new mothers now because we don't know what to expect. We're all kind of ushered through this, like we're corralled into this allopathic um, birth process in hospitals and we none of us know what we're doing until we experience it and then we're like, what the hell was that? That was not what I was expecting. I feel 
violated in a lot of ways. I feel disrespected. I felt like it didn't go the way I wanted it to. I felt like I was pressured in a lot of ways. I felt like I wasn't an advocate in my own birth experience. And then we end up in this traumatized post-birth situation where we're kind of doubting ourselves. We have people around us telling us, oh, well, at least the baby's safe, the baby's alive. And that that becomes the bar we set in this birth space, the allopathic birth space, even many times birth centers as well. Those, and that's another conversation. A birth center is very much an extension of a hospital birth, um, just in a prettier environment. So we have this low bar set of, as long as our baby's alive, we're <laughs> so dismissed as the woman, the, the mother giving birth, and it shows throughout history. This birth book, if you have not read it, The Surprising History of How We Are Born is shocking to say the least, least if you have not done any research into birth the history of how we birth please read this book and do some of your own kind of study and um i know this was brought up by uh when i spoke with birth like a mammal she talked about this to the show called the midwife which is also a, a good a good source to kind of see how birth has evolved and we are often showed or presented with this story that people, women were dying at a high rate. Mamas, moms and babies were all dying birthing at home because it's so dangerous and dirty and everyone needed a doctor. And that's why they brought it to the hospital. It was like this humanitarian effort to help save women and were safer and more protected in a hospital, which is really bullshit because it was brought into a hospital because of the allopathic model as a profit-based business. Um, it is what it is because when they first started training OBs, they were just doctors who were like, yeah, we'll start doing this. And like as surgeons, and just kind of started experimenting in ways to, to help women in birth. And it became a, this idea of saving women from the pain of birth. So it's almost presented as this, uh, it's a heroine effort. And when we really consider the drama triangle in our life, in every spaces of our life, we can really start to identify that because when you're not the one who is calling the shots, holding your sovereign space, then you are hold you are leaving a vulnerable opening for someone else to step in and hero you. And when you walk into a hospital these days, there really isn't a space for you to be a autonomous, sovereign mother in your birth. Because the second you walk in a hospital, you're signing consent forms that basically give up that right and allow a doctor to do what they, just, what they think is right. And in certain situations like emergencies where a person is obviously dying or unconscious or not able to just it's not a situation where you're the expert um then yes do whatever life-saving procedures you need but that's not what birth is birth is not a medical event it is not an emergency event and the way society has built birth now is to always treat it as a medical event and it's become the norm 
And to have that peaceful home birth has now become the exception. It's like the rare circumstance that a woman is in the perfect environment and equipped to birth at home. It's become the exception when it should be the opposite. And like I said, they've created this dynamic where we've been told you're brought into hospitals because birth used to be so dangerous and everybody died in the streets and all these women were dying of infections. And the reasons that was happening was because there wasn't knowledge in the t at that time either of not sticking your hands in women and not bothering them and disturbing them and heroing their birth. There's such a stage throughout history where it went from women who were the keepers and midwives and healers in the community and then they became the ones who were burned at the stakes for being witches and that's really when things shifted because it became an attack on the magic of birth the magic of healers and herbalism um and and our sovereignty to birth at home, to use herbal medicine, to practice what we want in our own home space. And with that became this fear and this hiding of what birth is and the divinity behind it. That's my kids. Um, so there's this deep wound within all women, within our ancestral lines, within our feminine lineage that is so deeply rooted around this witch wound, essentially, because the witch wound encompassed all sorts of healing modalities that is was considered witchcraft when a lot of it was just midwifery and herbalism and holistic wellness practices. And we still see this kind of voodoo, woo-woo um, judgment toward that. And it's still carrying on in current society. It's becoming a little bit more coming to the surface, but we still have this real solid divide. And you, I'm sure you can see it of the people being like, trust the science, go to the hospital, see an expert, a doctor, you're not smart enough to do this. And the ones who are coming back to nature and the wisdom of our bodies and our, our instincts, our wisdom as women, as humans, to come back to nature and the way of energy, the way of the universe and our connection with all of that, um, everything around us is in interconnected. And we have this connection to the divine that comes in in birth as well. And as long as allopathic medicine doesn't acknowledge that type of spiritual connection that not only birth brings, um, but all healing modalities, essentially, we don't just heal on a physical level. That's only one aspect of healing. We have the energetic body and the physical and the mental and the emotional and the astral. Like there's so many parts of us. And if you only work in the physical, only just like the tangible science-y part of it, then you're missing a really big piece of who we are. Because we're not just a physical vessel. And women have been treating, treated for so long as just the physical vessel. That sun is in my face. <laughs> the light of the divine shining through. Um, women have just been treated as this physical vessel that offers a baby out. You're just the one who carries the baby. You don't matter in terms of the birth because the baby being alive is the only thing that matters. And that shows how absolutely dehumanized a mother is in a birth situation. Just look at the way a C-section is done. And I understand that there are the rare circumstances where a C-section is 
necessary to save lives, but it should be the rare circumstance. But just think about what we're doing and how often it happens to just cut into a woman and pull a baby out while it is a really amazing progress in medicine. It is so um, vastly overused and how quickly it's caught, it's, it's, it's so quickly taken to that level um, because there's a, a big misunderstanding of, um, around birth. There's always this medical mind that wants to take control of the situation. They want to be the ones in control and to dictate and to hero the patient. And that precisely is why you will never be the authority of your birth if you were in a hospital or even a birth center. Um, because as long as you are hiring somebody who is the quote unquote expert, they are gonna be the one who calls the shots. And yes, there are midwives who are good at letting the mother be the leader. I had one, thank goodness I did have one. She was very earth-based, very holistic based, didn't touch me at all for my second two births, the two, the two home births. And um, even asked if I wanted to be stitched. She explained to me how bad a tear was, asked me if I wanted stitching or not, said I didn't really need it, it would heal, it's okay. I actually, She actually put seaweed to help the tissues heal, which was amazing. So I didn't have to get a st any stitches in the either of my second two, and I had stitches in my first. Um, but to go back to that too, my first birth was not at all how I saw it. And because I knew a little bit, I knew what I didn't want essentially, as far as like no Hep B, no vitamin K, no erythromycin, the IgoB. And then I started to kind of be pushed because they throw these emergencies at you. Know, they show, they throw the blood work and the kind of fear cards at you to get you to do what they want you to do. And because of the situation and how it can really create the stress energy in your body, it's hard for us to stay kind of level headed in the decision making process. You get flustered and you don't necessarily always have a clear mind of what to do. And it's almost like that that's what they play off of. Um, because I know so many women who come out of C-sections and be like, man, that was just a whirlwind. I don't remember anything. I, I was like wheeled in and, and things were going this way. And then they told me I had to do this. And I came out, I was like, I don't know what happened. And then I, I have a baby in my arms. And then they just are trying to unpack all of what just happened to them. And then you're realizing like, my goodness, was that necessary? Because it's usually not. We're doing this abdominal surgery, even just an induction. There is zero reason to be induced, literally. And there's constant, and I know that I get the pushback from women all the time. There's the constant justification of like why they had to do it. Because you want to, you want to feel like your story was the exception that you didn't make a mistake, that you had to do that because there's still that grief, that guilt that you haven't worked through yet. And that's probably the hardest reality to face too. It's not a blame game. It's not a game of like, you were stupid and wrong and you shouldn't have made that decision. Cause I, can, I now can look back 11 years after I had my son and through this whole process. And I didn't even come to terms with it until I went through radical birth school with Yolanda and Emily and that kind of opened my mind I'm like it's not me who did something wrong that's not the point of it's not to carry shame or guilt for what happened in your birth because that's not the point it's to hold a level of self-responsibility and be able to acknowledge 
feel, accept each thing that happened and kind of look from a higher perspective outside of your body what happened and whether it was actually necessary, what was being done to you and why, and it allows you a space to really feel and process. Because I'd say the majority of women aren't given the space to even process their birth. They're just told, it's good your baby's alive. Don't worry about it. It's all, we're so thankful the baby's alive and that's all that matters. And then the mom is sitting here like, I don't feel like everything's okay. I don't feel okay. And then we see all these cases of postpartum depression happening. Why do you think that is? Their pain and grief and fear and loss isn't being acknowledged. They often pushed into, into consent, even if they didn't necessarily want it, manipulated and, and coerced, sometimes even completely non-consensual. A, do a doctor just does stuff and then afterwards the woman's like, that was not okay because they don't know. It's hard to advocate for yourself when you're so caught up in this scary energy of what they're telling you. And there's so much to say and it's so hard to unpack at the same time. So even now, 11 years after my first baby was born, I have now been able to kind of carry the grief and loss of what I had hoped that that birth would look like. Um, but then we're also kind of thrown into new motherhood, coming out of this traumatic birth and then handed this baby and we're, and we're expected to just go on and be fine, which is insane. <laughs> And then we're like, why does postpartum depression happen at such a high rate? Well, I don't know, because we're traumatizing women in birth and then sending them off on their loneliness and heartbreak and depression to try to be a good mom. <laughs> and then the bar is set like so high to be good mothers. And we're like, I haven't healed from my birth yet. <laughs> so... That's why I created this space too, because I felt lonely as hell coming in as a new mom, kind of trying to figure out what happened in this first birth of like, what did I do wrong? Why did this end up the way it did? Did I make the right decisions? Could I have done something different? Was it really necessary to induce? God, it could have been a C-section. I should just be grateful that I had a vaginal birth. And then we're like, oh, well, it was natural enough. I said that even afterwards. It was kind of natural. No, it was a vaginal birth, but it was not natural <laughs> at all. <laughs> I was on Pitocin. It gave me morphine at night to sleep. I had Cervidil. Uh, I was given IV fluids the whole time. I could barely move around because I was hooked up to crap all the time. Yeah, there, there was nothing. It was a vaginal birth in a very uh, not natural situation. And that's the other low bar we've created. <laughs> It's a vaginal birth. Cool. High five. Then they're like, what else happened? That really shouldn't have happened to me. And this shame is pre pushed onto moms because they're the ones who have to walk out of the hospital and process what happened or try to process what happened. Oftentimes it doesn't get processed because now you're a new mom who needs to nurse her baby and take care of her baby and often men go back to work very early and then they're just left alone to sit in their pain and depression and not given a space to actually unpack, accept and release and heal from what happened. Which is why, by the way, I offer birth trauma sessions. If you ever wanted to contact me for those, you can find it on my website. Um, I mean, just to be able to tell your birth story, 
to someone who isn't going to like correct you or give you that, um, that softening blow. I was like, well, aren't you thankful that the baby's okay? Just be able to express how you feel about what happened. Say how your birth went and be able to have the space to feel anger or sadness or grief or whatever comes up, like all of it is okay. It's yours to work through, but you don't have to do it alone. We're so hyper independent often because we've been raised in these environments where we weren't allowed our emotions. So then we become like hyper independent, like I don't need anybody to support me, I'm good. I'm a prime example of that. <laughs> I've always dealt with all of it on my own, in my own lonesome space, usually with music or dancing, and that's why I'm so big with that. But that's also why I craved that community because I didn't have a mother who I could rely on who was really there, never had that mother-daughter relationship I could really sit with and feel supported. Um, went through a miscarriage without that support system. I had one friend, wonderfully, who she's on here, maybe she'll see this, <laughs> was amazing to have her around because I didn't really tell anybody else at the time other than the dad of the baby. <clears throat> but all these things that women now are kind of forced to deal with on their own or try to talk to their partner, which there are some things that isn't meant to be carried by your partner. They're not necessarily meant to be your everything. There are some things that we as women are meant to share with other women and other mothers who can actually understand and hold what you are sharing. Because this type of stuff, your partner doesn't, I mean, they can see it from their perspective but they can't understand it as a woman experiencing it. And that's another thing too. I think that women need community and other women and sisterhood and compassion in ways that I think men need it as well, but just in a different way. If we look back historically in like tribes, which I think is where humans actually thrived the most was kind of in little community tribes, smaller community bases. The women were the ones who nurtured the community within the sisterhood, within each other and all the kids. That's where we really get that phrase of it takes a village. And it's not taking the village to, to raise a child. It's taking the village to support the mother who then can nurture her child because a mother who is running on empty and in a traumatic state often gets into like this freeze state fight or flight mode and then she's not able to show up for her children the way she needs the way they need i mean so then the way we birth matters so much because the way we birth creates that blueprint or that imprint, I guess, blueprint for how we are as a mother, for how we enter motherhood. So birth itself can be such a consciousness expanding experience when we really connect with the divine, when we come, you know, right to the, the veil of life and death and ushering in these spirits to this earthly realm is such a spiritual soul expanding a soul expanding experience when we're allowed that space and i really feel like the way it's been brought into hospitals has been almost deliberate to suppress this intuitive divinity that women carry this inner guidance system this wisdom that women hold because women are very much a body-based human. Women are more body-based 
grounded in the body, that strong intuitive guidance we get, that divine connection, which is what anchors us in the body and um, walks us into motherhood, we'll say. Even just womanhood, but motherhood in particular, we'll talk about. And men are more in the mind. Um, and that's why women get this strong, intuitive wisdom. And it's almost like men had feared that divinity that women carry, especially as they become mothers, that it was almost intentionally suppressed to keep women below men. And now we're finally getting to this time where we're allowed to kind of rise up or we're pulling ourselves out of that wounded place where that witch wound took place. And we're stepping into this feminine awakening to stand in our sovereignty again, to reconnect with our ancestors, to reconnect with that feminine wisdom, that divinity, our instincts, our primal nature, and kind of bring a harmony in the body with our intellect as well. Because it's not just living in the primal body space, but bringing that conscious intellect that we've evolved into as well. So wildly awakened motherhood came from how I experienced my three different births and how when I came into a wild and primal state of birth, really being in the body and letting my body lead me 